Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to all of you who join us for this uh, webinar. Uh, it is a pleasure to have today Professor Lu Santos, Luis Santos Pereira. But before going into the webinar that he will present, let me show a short presentation of the Fidi Knowledge Project. Uh, Fidi Knowledge Project is uh, conducted in collaboration between the Mediterranean Agronomic Institute and uh, the uh, Politecnico of uh, Di Milano in the context of the Expo 2015 in uh, Milan. The main idea of the project is that we are trying to uh, uh, develop knowledge that is the best way to identify concrete solutions for food security that really meet the needs of the countries, and we are dealing with the Mediterranean countries. Uh, main objective, creating opportunities for dialogue and development through a Mediterranean network of experts, focus on research, innovation, and transfer of knowledge for food security. Uh, within the project, there are five uh, priorities. The first one is sustainable nature resources management, and this webinar today is uh, exactly dealing with this priority. The second one is quantitative and qualitative uh, enhancement of crop products. The third is socioeconomic dynamics and global markets. The fourth, sustainable development of small rural communities in marginal areas. And the fifth deals with Mediterranean food consumption patterns, diet, environment, society, economy, and health. Uh, what are the main results that we would like to achieve within this project? Well, the first one is that uh, we are working really hard to establish a Euro-Mediterranean scientific network on research and innovation for food security. So uh, all of you that are attending us are most welcome to join. Uh, second is to uh, develop this international technology platform of the Feeding Knowledge Project. And then uh, uh, we are operating in uh, 12 Mediterranean countries, so uh, identifying 12 focal points that support the uh, knowledge development and, and distribution at the local level. Uh, to do that, uh, the fourth uh, main result is that we are also working towards uh, transferring these uh, research results to uh, local stakeholders through the National Extension Services, and then finally uh, to provide support to policymakers for uh, developing and elaborating effective policies on research and innovation for food security. Uh, what is the target area? As I mentioned, we are dealing within the Euro-Mediterranean region, and the 12 countries are Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Libya, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestinian National Authority, Southeast Europe, European countries, Tunisia, and Turkey. But the intention of the uh, Feeding Knowledge Project and also as a major legacy of the Expo 2015 of Milan is that these activities will be expanded progressively into other regions of the world. So uh, how to uh, implement these activities? Uh, as you see, we are organizing these uh, open webinars and the first cycle of that uh, was conducted between December 2012 and March 13. You see the number is 183 persons who attended, but I would say that the number is much larger because these webinars actually are available on the uh, web page of the project. So the people who have uh, watched at them is, is really, really much larger. And then there is a second cycle of uh, webinars with international experts. We started in March 2013 and will end up in June uh, this year. Uh, now, the uh, other issue where we are working is drafting of uh, white papers for each of the priorities that I already mentioned. So these white papers, practically we're trying to do an in-depth analysis of the state of the art of research for the topics of each priority and then identify what are the needs and how we can formulate policy recommendations for decision makers. 
there is the web page of the project, www.feedingknowledge.net. So you are welcome to uh, log in and, and then follow us through that uh, international platform. Uh, we really, as I mentioned, working hard to establish a large network of, of, of researchers and experts that have knowledge and want to share their expertise and innovation for uh, food security. Uh, how to get involved? You can get involved by uh, logging up uh, at the web page that I mentioned, but also you can follow us in Facebook and in uh, Twitter. So with this one, I thank you very much for uh, all your attention, and please join us to share your ideas on, on, on food security. Now I would like also to launch a, a video that has been uh, prepared by the project, and uh, it describes what uh, this project is about and what we are trying to do. Today, food security is still a promise. Knowledge is the way to make it real. Feeding Knowledge will establish an international scientific network for research and innovation, supported by an international technology platform. The network will promote the transfer of knowledge on food security and support policies and programs that really meet the needs of developing countries. In order to build the basis of the Expo Milano 2015 legacy, Feeding Knowledge supports the recognition and dissemination of best sustainable development practices on food security. Feeding Knowledge, International Network for Research and Innovation on Food Security. Okay, um, as I mentioned, the speaker of today is uh, Professor Luis Santos Pereira. Uh, Professor Pereira graduated in 1969 as agricultural engineer at the Technical University of Lisbon. Then he followed postgraduate study in hydrology at the Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne in, uh, in Switzerland. Then he got his PhD in 1977 from the Swiss uh, Federal Institute of Technology in, in Zurich. Uh, Professor Pereira is uh, very well known worldwide for his large experience. Uh, he has supervised uh, many, many students, 39 PhD students, 53 master students, some of them also here at our institute. But he uh, has experience also with uh, uh, universities around the world like the Inner Mongolia Agricultural University in China, the Agricultural University of Beijing, uh, University of uh, Federal uh, de Santa Maria in Brazil. Uh, Professor Ferreira has also uh, consulted with many UN agencies including FAO, UNDP, WMO, UNESCO, ICARDA. Uh, he's also Honorary President of the International Commission of Agriculture Engineering and Honorary Vice President of the International Commission of Irrigation and Drainage. So it's really a great pleasure for us to have him with us today. And so without losing too much time, I would like to invite him for his, uh, for his talk. So Professor Pereira, please. Thank you, Pandi. Uh, thank you, Pandi. I, good afternoon to everyone that is listening. I hope that uh, you may enjoy some and uh, share some of uh, the ideas about uh, water scarcity, climate change, and challenges for food security in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Mediterranean is marked uh, by water scarcity. Since uh, and the south, very large areas have uh, less than 1,000 cubic meters per capita per year. And in the north, uh, northern areas, the, 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 this rate does not exceed very much the two 
thousand cubic meters per capita and per year. In fact, uh, looking to this uh, the example, the year in graphic, we may see that uh, northern Africa countries that uh, share the Mediterranean with other countries have uh, a very low water availability, probably the least uh, in the worldwide areas. The Western Mediterranean is also quite low values, below the threshold of 2,000 cubic meters per year and per person, while the Southern, Medi Southern Europe that also shares the Mediterranean is also uh, quite low values, a little bit above these 2,000 cubic meters per year and per person. This water scarcity is due to various uh, reasons. First is the aridity of the climate. And the second is uh, another uh, climate climatic aspect, it is the occurrence of droughts. Both are natural. But there is also man-made water scarcity that uh, corresponds exactly to what we call desertification, and that is a long stage of uh, lack of uh, water and degradation of land resources, and a short period water shortage. Everything is aggravated by poor water management, increased demand and pollution and contamination, in addition to climate change. So you can see in this map that uh, the Mediterranean is very well marked by aridity. These colors, uh, yellow or brown, indicate clearly that Southern and the East Mediterranean uh, have quite low water available. But main problem regards probably the groundwater, because the scarcity of groundwater is extremely large, since uh, many of the countries that are surrounding the Mediterranean explore more than 100% of the recharge of the groundwater. So, mining of groundwater calls for new management, new protection, recharge, recovery, in order to achieve the further food security in the area. Climate change uh, affects Mediterranean probably more than elsewhere since that uh, together with the, the East Europe, these are the two hot spots of uh, uh, predicted climate change. This uh, the climate change is uh, somewhat evident, slowly introduced uh, during uh, the last century, when the relative trends of mean annual precipitation are statistically significant in relatively large areas for decreasing precipitation and, uh, contrary, a bit increase in the northern Iberian Peninsula. This is associated, of course, with the occurrence of droughts and particularly is shown here by the intensity of droughts that are uh, aggravating in terms of intensity, not frequency, to, for uh, large areas in the Mediterranean. What is expected that is probably difficult to deal with is uh, the occurrence of dry spells. For instance, the, these dry spells are expected to increase everywhere, 
in Europe, and particularly in the Mediterranean. And uh, the summer dry spell over the southern Iberian Peninsula are expected to increase by 20 days. This uh, creates problems and challenges to the water availability. Temperature is expected to increase uh, from a little bit less than 1 degree to a little bit more than 2 degrees particularly in southern and east and, uh, and the east Mediterranean areas. Precipitation is uh, expected to decrease more or less over the entire Mediterranean uh, areas. So both the, on the west and east sides of uh, the, the Mediterranean Sea. And this decrease can vary uh, from uh, 50 to about to a little bit more than 100 millimeters. The fact that, uh, uh, that water scarcity always occurred in the Mediterranean made that uh, large uh, areas in the Mediterranean, the northern part, are now irrigated. So this is an old tradition. In southern areas, there is less water availability, and so there is less possibilities to irrigate, with the exception, of course, of Egypt with the Nile River. This uh, is uh, quite uh, evident, this contrast in this picture, that shows that uh, there is less irrigation in the areas where there is uh, more scarcity. So this is a threat to uh, food security, of course. And this is this threat is important when we consider that the population will increase, will keep increasing. So the population of the world population was a little bit more than two billion people when I was born, and it is now above 7 billion. This, uh, what will be next? Uh, will we be 8 billion, 9 billion, 10 billion in the next uh, 40 years? Of course, this is not uh, uh, an indifferent question when we are looking for the food security at the world scale and of course at the mid the east and north african scale because there is an increase the number of population in risk of hunger in africa and there is no trends for decrease of risk of hunger in middle east and north africa irrigation is contributing to agricultural production very highly and we can see that around 20% of Arab land is irrigated and that this Arab land is producing around 60% of the cereals in the world. Unfortunately, this is not exactly these numbers that occur at the scale of the Mediterranean area. Trends in cereal yields are good, but they are particularly good for the non-irrigated areas where it is possible to have an excellent distribution of precipitation, like it is the case of UK and France. There is also a trend for increase in irrigated areas in large countries like China. And this represents that the yield gap that exists between actual and potential production from irrigated areas is quite large, and being quite large represents a potential if efforts are done in order to increase both the agronomic and irrigation engineering approaches 
for the cereal and the agriculture production in irrigated areas. Not that the potential for irrigation largely exceeds the potential for rain-fed crops. There are good perspectives if we consider, for instance, uh, what has been observed uh, in the Yaqui Valley of Mexico, where the farmers have uh, nowadays, in these last 60 years, multiplied the yield of wheat by about 3.5. So it means that uh, if they have been able in Mexico, probably we will be able in other parts of the world, in, in particularly around the Mediterranean. However, we don't have much water and we don't have much money and uh, therefore the area equipped for irrigation is not increasing with the same level as in the past. Near East in North Africa knows a decrease by about four times in the rate of growth of irrigation. But in the developed countries that include those countries in northern of Mediterranean are now at a null rate. So there is no growth of irrigated areas. And probably there is a decrease in several areas, in several countries like my own. This uh, condition of lack of water creates in the region that is more uh, challenging in the Mediterranean, that is near eastern North Africa, a big, uh, enormous pressure on the water resources, since that the withdrawal of water resources is very large relative to other uses. So, this requires particular approaches for internal management of the resources relative to other users. And since that uh, new other users, like it is the case of municipal uses and the industrial uses, are growing much faster than irrigation. Irrigation keeps being uh, the sector that uh, withdraws more water, but uh, it is uh, losing the relative importance uh, in favor, slowly in favor of industrial and municipal uses. One big problem that we may face is the question that relates whether the climate change is the question of the prices of the commodity produces from agriculture. Since that uh, all are expected to increase normally, but they are expected to increase much more due to pressures due uh, to climate change. This may favor irrigated agriculture or investment by farmers in uh, the technologies, but these do not favor the people that is at risk of hunger in our countries. Climate change uh, will impact most of crops. I just have here an example of a study developed uh, in the year. Uh, in this institute, where we find out that the crop evapotranspiration for non-stress olives that represents around 400 to 600 millimeters in the most of the northern regions of the Mediterranean and much higher values in the southern will not change very much to 2050. So, for non-stressed olives, 
the evapotranspiration demand probably will not change very much. You can see by the colors that the colors are maintained in between 2000 and 2050. However, the stress, the water stress for rain-fed olives is expected to largely increase. The blue color in these pictures represented the low stress and the red colors or represented the extremely high stress. And you can see that from 2000 to 2015, the blue colors disappear or become lighter, and the yellow and red colors increase largely. This means that rain-fed olives groves, as we know them nowadays, will probably disappear in large areas in the Mediterranean region. The question uh, is important because we need that uh, to keep production in uh, agriculture we need more irrigation, but no irrigation means uh, a larger share with other sectors. And if we compare the OECD countries, that includes, of course, those that are on the northern Mediterranean areas, with the West Asia and North Africa countries, we can see that uh, in OECD we use much more water than in West Asia and North Africa, and that uh, we use much less water for irrigation or for agriculture. So this means that uh, the policies that may be created by the OECD are probably not adequate uh, for the uh, southern, mid southern and East Mediterranean countries. So a need for developing new policies probably has to be stressed. Uh, this corresponds to the existence of uh, many paradoxes. I like very much to compare these two paradoxal irrigation systems. One, by end, probably these uh, the, will disappear in the next future, and the other with an uh, enormous machine that irrigates around 200 hectares at once. In fact, this uh, lack of knowledge about the, the conditions that prevail at farm level makes that pressure on water use in irrigation is conveyed through a probably wrong and unfeasible approaches, like it is the case of calling farmers to decrease water consumption pay full cost of water, improve irrigation efficiencies, and produce more crop per drop. However, farmers know and can control, reduce water demand, improve water use and productivity if they have access to appropriate technologies and information. In fact, uh, this uh, Irrigation is a very complex process since it involves uh, the reservoir, the system, conveyance and distribution, the field application, and the production of the yield itself. With the occurrence of uh, several processes uh, that are beneficial, that is the case of uh, the crop uh, e papo transpiration and the leaching of soils in the soil and non-beneficial water uses that correspond to the evaporation from the free water surfaces, seepage and runoff from canals and conduits, percolation and runoff from the farm, and non property from weeds and others. So there is the need to understand that if farmers have to reduce uh, 
the water use, they have to reduce the non-beneficial water uses. And they have to probably maximize or optimize the beneficial water uses. So, we need to understand how to improve the water use uh, knowing the pathways of water in the agricultural irrigation production. So we identify these pathways, it is required to identify the ways how to maximize beneficial uses, how to minimize non-beneficial uses, how to avoid water losses, and how to achieve higher water productivity. All these makes the efficient water use. Water productivity is uh, very much important, uh, and uh, it can be observed at a different scales from the system to the farm, and it can be observed also at a different plant to crop scales. One is the water productivity at the plant scale relating evapotranspiration to yield. Another is the post including all the water that uh, can be used and the production that is due to that water. But we can also look just for the irrigation water productivity. This uh, ratio of uh, water productivity represents the ratio between actual yields, precipitation, with precipitation, capillary rise, uh, soil water, and irrigation. So, between uh, uh, the, pro the yield, actual yield, and evapotranspiration and leaching fraction, that corresponds to the beneficial uses and all the non-beneficial uses. So, increasing water productivity is a matter of increasing the yields and is a matter of minimizing the non-beneficial water uses. So this is not exactly more crop per drop. If we look, for instance, uh, examples like in this one from a study that we developed in Syria some years ago, we can understand that there is uh, difficult uh, uh, approaches because looking for the utility that is a, relate, a relative value of uh, the indicators that we selected, we can understand that uh, the utility may grow in terms of uh, use of water when we apply better technologies here in case of surface irrigation, but this corresponds to a decrease uh, in the, the ratio between uh, the yield value and the costs uh, of uh, production. So, this opposition makes uh, evident that uh, modernizing and improving irrigation is extremely difficult and is a matter of uh, economics uh, besides a uh, matter of technology. Many people say that uh, people uh, should change into, uh, surf into deep irrigation because it may save water. That's fine. The big problem is that uh, while we get uh, less use of water with uh, the surface uh, with the drip irrigation, we get uh, a lower res economic result that is represented by this uh, uh, X in this uh, picture. So this uh, means that we have uh, a big challenge in front of us that is to make economic uh, the approaches that will lead to an improved uh, irrigation. So, I may conclude saying that the water plays a main role in food production, particularly in Mediterranean countries, when rainfall is low and crop water requirements are high. 
I shall say that there is a potential for improving land and water productivity, and there is also a potential for increasing the performance of irrigation systems. Climate change will impact the Mediterranean uh, area, but uh, there is a potential for adaptation. However, improving land productivity, water use performance, and economic water productivity are challenges uh, for the Mediterranean countries to solve the problems of the people that face food security requirements, but that requires challenging innovative research. Economic policies improve the public awareness and democratic governance with users' participation. Finally, I would say that in addition to approaches and collaboration, we need also approaches on solidarity between the southern and northern Mediterranean countries. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Professor Pereira. It's a very comprehensive uh, presentation that you made, and for sure it looks like that the Mediterranean uh, has to face a number of challenges ahead in this competing interest for, for water and the same for land, and climate change probably will make things worse. So we do need to be prepared in order to, uh, to face also food security issues. Now I would like to uh, inform all the audience that uh, uh, you can make questions to Professor Pereira, and uh, after I present the activities that we are handling into the priority one, he will then uh, will, uh, will respond to all your questions. So uh, let me brief you about uh, the uh, priority one on sustainable nature uh, resources management. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you see the, the, the team uh, that uh, we are working together here. I will show you also perhaps uh, uh, the pictures of everyone. So uh, uh, let me move on. Uh, there is the staff that is collaborating with us. First of all, our Land and Water Resources Management Department. My name is Pandis Druli, so you probably already noticed that. And then I recognize all the support that we are receiving from the head of the Land and Water uh, resources Management Department, Professor uh, Nicola Lavadalena. Uh, a lot of support also from uh, Mladen Todorovic, who is a senior research scientist, mostly dealing with climate change issues. Alessandra Scardino with water research. And uh, then uh, Rami Saliba, who is a PhD student uh, within our department. Uh, of course, we have also the support from the Mediterranean Organic Agriculture Department. Jenny Calabrese looking at biodiversity issues, Gaetano Ladiza supporting land, and uh, land degradation and desertification issues, and uh, Vincenzo Verastro uh, dealing with energy issues. I also mentioned that there are at least three scientific advisors who are supporting us. You just heard the presentation of uh, Professor Pereira. Uh, Mario Marino is with the FAO, with the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources and also Antonio Coppola, who is a professor at the University of Basilicata here in Italy. Uh, I also recognize the support that we are receiving from the method group of Politecnico di Milano, Valeria Baudo, Gianfranco Elia, Paola Corti, and Francesca Concha, as well as uh, Laura Civetti who, is, uh, Civetti, who is next to me, and Marinella Gianelli inside the, uh, our institute. They are really, really grateful. We are very grateful for all the support that they are providing to us. Uh, we use a lot of uh, e-collaboration tools like the Dropbox and then Skype and emails to share our uh, activities. Uh, where the main pillar of this uh, uh, priority as well as for the other priorities is developing this white paper. So uh, practically I don't want to go into detail now, but the key messages are that we are working on uh, scarcity of land and water resources under a changing climate, as it was also presented by uh, Professor Pereira. Uh, just to mention that only 5% of the land that is fit for agriculture is available in, in the MENA. And then there is a big issue of the uh, Mediterranean coast that is uh, uh, almost 40% is already urbanized and we're losing at a high rate still 
very fertile soils that otherwise could be used for agriculture. There's a big issue of desertification, affecting almost 40% of the region and 31% of the population. I don't want to repeat now again how scarce the water resources are, but this is also in within the priority we're dealing with biodiversity and energy issues. And let, I, let me mention that only 10% of the world's endemic plants are located only 1.6% of the world's surface. That is the Mediterranean, which is also the world's 18th biological hotspot. Uh, the region is also rich in the fossil fuels, but maybe they will be running out after some time. Uh, but it is also rich in renewable energy sources, uh, solar and wind, I can mention, which have to be uh, used and, and expanded. There's been work on that. Uh, and on the other side, uh, irrigated agriculture, as you have also mentioned uh, previously, rely heavily on energy sources. We do need to have energy to expand also or at least maintain irrigation at the levels uh, that are at the moment. Uh, then we look at population trends and availability of nature resources, and we see that there are some very contrasting uh, scenarios between north and south, and uh, population is increasing faster in the south, in the MENA region, where the resources are uh, scarce. We have still 41% of the population in the MENA that lives in, uh, in rural areas that they rely on agriculture. So uh, uh, then there are the big issues of, of water use, and uh, on the other side, uh, uh, losses on biodiversity surely will threaten also food security. And I also mentioned the importance of renewable energy sources that needs to find a better way of use, uh, specifically in the in, in the MENA region. So these are some of the issues that we are trying to address. Uh, what are the objectives? So first of all, yeah, we make a state of the art of uh, what resources are available and uh, uh, then analyze uh, the pressures and, 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 and the trends. And we look at this very interlinked nexus actually between the land, water, climate change, biodiversity, energy, and how they are all going to influence uh, food security uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, finally, it is important to identify future research needs and provide policy support to the decision makers. So we know the problems, we know the effects of, of climate change and, and all the related issues, and we do need also to find out some solutions because we can't just look at the doom scenario, but also there are uh, uh, optimistic issues that have to be considered as well. Uh, within the feeding knowledge, I already mentioned also in my introductory remarks, that is the web page, and you can also follow us on uh, Twitter and, and Facebook. But the most important uh, aspect that I would like to mention is that uh, you can see here in Priority 1, and I would like to invite uh, many of you to join us within this priority and share and, and, and discuss mostly the white paper that will be ready by the end of this month, and then the final uh, version of the white paper will be ready by the end of September. So we really would like to, to share that with you. Now, uh, we are working on, uh, on a team, and we would like to put the rail tracks right as, as they should be, and not uh, uh, complaining uh, who did what. So we'd like to coordinate these activities very well from the beginning. And uh, uh, it, it is a challenging work, but uh, we remain hopeful that we will, uh, we will succeed. So with that, I really thank you for uh, being with us today. And let me also uh, give the floor again to Professor Pereira, who will try to respond and uh, entertain the, the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the questions that you placed. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, most of the people is uh, related the questions to climate change quest, to climate change challenge. In fact, uh, for instance, Philippe uh, Debs is uh, asking about uh, uh, how mitigation and adaptation measures, or which kind of adaptation and mitigation and adaptation measures can be developed in the water set. 
I would say that uh, uh, in related to agriculture, it is, uh, uh, of course, uh, related with what I said. So, a better knowledge of the pathways of the water in order to understand which are the non-beneficial water uses and to try to limit this non-beneficial water uses in order to increase the approach or the use of the beneficial ones. This is not only related with agriculture because there is non-beneficial water uses in many other sectors. So this means that uh, we need uh, to develop uh, policies uh, that correspond, of course, to measures that can support practices of uh, more efficient water use, knowing what means this target. Uh, Antonio Prisciantelli demands if there is any possibility, any sustainable and margins for more balance in the water distribution. This is a little bit difficult to be answered because this is very much the base of the policies. Uh, if we consider that uh, a large share of industry water use in developing in developed countries. If we intend to do the same in developing countries, it will not be possible. There is, uh, of course, uh, other ways of uh, uh, doing so. That is, the use of water with low quality uh, for purposes that are less. Uh, stringent in terms of use. There is the possibility to better use the salinized water, but there is uh, uh, a lot of problems to be solved because the use of the salinized water for irrigation is not a gift. That, that neither because of the price, neither because of the environmental and the practical consequences. So, this corresponds to the need to establish uh, well-funded policies relative to the water use in, uh, uh, in the different countries, particularly in the South. Amit El Bilali uh, asked which could be the most advisable short and medium term coping strategies to improve food security status. I would say that uh, the, first, uh, the first big question on this, on first uh, response on this, is to have a better conscience about the needs and about the possibilities that the, or the potential. We have to improve, really, in MENA region, the agronomic practices and the, the water use practices. This will take long term. And this is the only, probably the only, the only way to achieve food self-sufficiency. But this requires an effort to develop technologies that are really adapted to the existing conditions in Mediterranean, not only uh, to uh, just place something in use because others say or because this is uh, successful in other parts of the world. Marinella Gianelli asks what is the most pressing research needs in the near future? Uh, where we should invest to increase water use efficiency. So. First, uh, I don't like the term water use efficiency, I like the term efficient water use, so not the substantive but the adjective for efficiency. <laughs> but uh, my question is, uh, or my answer can be, of course, uh, 
but the understanding the economic relations relative to food production and irrigation. We know little about this. I just showed the earth because there was no time for more. A small image showing the contradictions between water saving on one side and the economic, uh, economics of water use on the other side. Uh, we cannot say we have to do water saving, and we cannot say we have to be the most economic. So we have to find out solutions that uh, correspond to a trade-off. And the trade-off has to be positive to the farmers anyway, because the farmers can only maintain farming if they get a, a, a revenue. So the, the problem uh, that I would say is more pressing research needs is on the economic and social side related exactly to the possibility of what that is. Uh, Nordin, the US asks us or says that consider the, the assumption that our most fundamental societal problems grow out of a widespread pursuit of individual interests and benefits to solve the current crisis of water issues, if we believe that we all, Mediterranean countries, require to replace ethic or individual rights by, with an ethic of the common good? That's a nice question because uh, uh, I, I, I was just telling that uh, instead of speaking about the new governance issues, I was talking about the uh, developing uh, uh, I, democratic governance issues. So we need to, to find out new approaches for democracy, that is a nice challenge, and we need to develop new approaches with the, the participation of the users of water. So. This goes into the idea of ethic of the common good instead of the ethic of individual rights. Of course, we have to keep the individual rights, but we have to place the individual rights looking ahead for the common uh, rights. Well, the Amit Bel Bilali returns with the second question and says, how changes in food consumption patterns and food wastage rate reduction can help improving water use efficiency in the whole food chain? Okay. I, I don't see the, the, the question related with water use efficiency anyway, but uh, I, I, I would say that uh, we have a lot to learn about uh, uh, de decreasing food wastage. And food wastage starts at farm level because of uh, the technologies for harvesting, the technology for transporting, for preserving, for conserving, for, <laughs> for all this chain. So, of course, uh, if we can decrease the wastage and losses of uh, food products, we, of course, uh, decrease uh, the number of cubic meters that are associated with a kilogram of any product. That is, uh, we decrease the so-called foot uh, step of uh, the... Ecological uh, food. Of, uh, the, the <laughs> uh, of uh, the food. Anyway. Finally, as is a... Uh, uh, Abu Abdillah says, I think that most important things in climate change studies is to improve climate change modeling to reduce uncertainties and to improve our observation and monitoring. I don't, I'm not sure about this because this is something that we are, uh, um, not myself exactly, but we, that we in research that we are relatively good. So I mean that uh, uncertainties will always occur with climate change or without climate change. So since that's the one good thing that uh, the climate has 
is it that associated uncertainties. But uh, the other thing that is uh, uh, important is probably the improved observation and monitoring of Earth and of the climate variables, including the observations of droughts. So we need to create information and create information on climate that can be used by modelers on different uh, 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 approaches to the problem of water and uh, non-water, of course, uh, uh, uses, of, uses of climate, to decrease there the uncertainties if the information is reliable. For instance, we are uh, uh, fighting after a certain time to develop what we call a drought watch system or drought watch systems in different countries. But this is extremely difficult because there is a lot of institutions interested with the droughts and with interested with collecting data and each institution wants to call themselves the most proper drought watch uh, institution. So there is a need beside what you say, a need for finding out new approaches for the institutional development. Uh, another important research field consists in identification of means of procedure that allows to distinguish between the change in the hydrologic cycle and those due to climate change, from those due to in human intervention and daily interaction. This is a complex question. Of course, we need to know what is the hydrologic cycle, how it changes with the... Uh, 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 uh. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, there are also, but you can also look at this one. Okay, okay. Uh, there is also a, a need to develop new institutions to a new approach to institutions or a new behavior of institutions. So the world has changed a, little, a lot during the last times with the crisis and the world has to change a lot in the next uh, future. But this change is not only on the economic side but is also on uh, the institutional side. Mm -hmm. And we need to start to be conscient about this. And one part of the problem of uh, the food security passes definitely by new approaches to the, uh, to, to the food production and to the food system and uh, to the way out to decrease the risk of uh, anger for many, many populations around the world. Another this question about the use of question water. that comes out is uh, from by Gaetano Ladisa, Ladisa probably <laughs> <laughs> that uh, says me in many countries the limited water resources are devoted to produce biofuel. What is your opinion about this paradox? Of course, this is a paradox, but uh, the the question there is to know uh, why. We don't speak so much about the uh, economies in, in, uh, in energy. So we are all talking about producing more energy and we are not talking enough about uh, making economies in energy. We, we speak about uh, the energy efficiency but we don't speak uh, very clearly, the word efficiency is very conf confused anyway. And uh, the biofuel crops can be uh, uh, produced uh, in rain fed conditions in northern countries, probably not in the southern countries. Probably it is not appropriate to have this in the southern countries. But uh, we also need to understand that if we would move all the systems to interpressurized irrigation, for instance, 
Many people want to have uh, the drip irrigation or the sprinkler irrigation to replace surface irrigation. The amount of energy that is required to that kind of change is absolutely enormous. And we don't have it. And this is some uh, that is kind of a demand that would create more problems to the uh, climate change uh, consequences. There is a, a, a further question by Amid 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 Bilali. Bilali. He is very talking today, at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> he always does that. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, asks how critical is the link water, the energy, and food security in the Mediterranean region. Okay, I was just uh, giving in a certain way a possible answer to this, saying that this is extremely critical because uh, we have few water, we have some energy, but not we are not rich in energy like it. Uh, uh, Central Asia, Central Asia, no, the, 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 the Saudi Arab, the, the, the Arab, Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabian United and Arab surrounding Arab. countries, yeah. we are not so rich uh, in uh, conditions for producing under rain fed uh, conditions. And uh, therefore, uh, we have difficulties in finding out this. Uh, proper links between water, energy, and food production, so in achieving food security. Uh, I, I will return back to the same question that I said before, relative to water is to, to try to uh, look at what is efficient water use, and about energy is to try to, to understand what kind of savings can we do instead of uh, how much uh, energy from biofuel we can we produce? Well, if I can add for the biofuels, we also have some kind of uh, a position in the white paper, but we really think at least for the MENA countries, that's not an option because we cannot uh, uh, feed our people with the crops that we produce. So entering into the biofuel business, it is uh, probably an option for well-developed countries like the U.S. maybe, even though there are consequences, but the, uh, the Mediterranean in particular, as I said, the MENA region, uh, it, it is not the way to go. So, well, we have, uh, but we have a lot of sunshine. We have other sources. To and use. we, we have, have a lot of wind. A wind, and uh, <laughs> before going so, to the biofuels, yeah. uh, it is a uh, It is expensive way. anyway. And it, it is, is very expensive to produce that well. energy. So we, we don't think that's... The, the, uh, the best option for, for our region. I would like uh, to uh, thank again very much uh, Professor Pereira for uh, all this uh, time he spent with us today and for this interesting uh, presentation that he made and for the uh, questions that were, I think, uh, well responded. Now, uh, before leaving, I would like also to announce that is going to be another webinar uh, I think it is the last one in this uh, cycle of uh, second uh, cycle of webinars, and that is going to happen on the June 10th, again at uh, 15 or 3 p.m. for one hour. And the title is "Sustainable Development of Small Rural Communities in uh, Marginal Areas." It will be uh, offered by Professor Graham Woodgate who is at the University College in London Institute of the Americas. So until then, uh, I say all of you goodbye. Thanks again for, for being with us this afternoon. I hope that it was useful and, and, and you will join for this last webinar on the 10th of June. Bye-bye now. <laughs>